I'm not going to preach your normal message that you would hear of what is your giant in your life. So don't tune out just because you think I'm going to say what you think I'm going to say, okay? Um, so again, that's 1 Samuel 20 through 47. Matthew 16, 16 and 17. And we're going to read Numbers 13, 25 through 14, 10. I know it's a lot of reading, but we need to get the whole picture of what God is trying to tell us today. The first thing that I want to bring out is if anybody remembers Samuel... In the book of Samuel, in the chapter of 16, David is anointed. And when the, he is being anointed, everybody overlooked him. They said, you're not, you're not the right fit to be a king. You don't look like it. You don't sound like it. You don't act like it. You need to get back out there in the field. And so my first point that I want to bring out to you is don't let people dictate what you should or should not do if God has called you. That God looks at the inward man, that He looks at the heart, He doesn't look at outward appearance. And He says that in 16, 7 through 8, that He looks at the heart of man. He told Jeremiah, I'm the one that formed you in your mother's womb. I know what I created you for. Don't make excuses. You could do this. I'll empower you to do this. He told the same thing to Moses. I created man's mouth. I know what I've called you to do. And so don't let man get in the way of God's calling for your life. Today we're going to talk about who or what is speaking into your life because it will have detrimental effects. Okay, so we're going to start in 1 Samuel 17, 20 through 47. Just bear with me. I know it's a lot of reading. So David arose early in the morning. Chapter 17, start in 20. And he left the flock with the keeper, and he took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came up to the circle of the camp while the army was going in battle array, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up in battle array, army against army. David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle line and entered in order to greet his brothers. And as he was talking with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine from Goth named Goliath, was coming up from the army of the Philistines, and he spoke these same words, and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, they fled from him. They were greatly afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who is coming up? Surely he's coming to defy Israel, and it will be that king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in according with his word, saying, Thus it will be done for the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and his anger burned against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your insolence and the wickedness of your heart, for you come down in order to see the battle. But David said, What have I done now? Was it not just a question? Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered the same thing as before. When the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail on account of him, your servant, will go and fight with the Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth, while he's been a warrior from his youth. David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. When a lion or a bear came and took lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him and rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And David said, The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul clothed David with his armor, 
garments and put a bronze helmet on his head and enclosed him with the armor. And David girded his sword over his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took them off. And he took his stick in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had had, even in his pouch. And his sling was in his hand. And he approached the Philistine. The Philistine came and approached David with the shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy with a handsome appearance. And the Philistine said to David, Am I just a dog that you would come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine also said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds in the sky and the beasts of the field. David said to the Philistine, You come to me with the sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of, arm, the, God of the armies of Israel whom you have taunted. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds in the sky, the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all of this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. You see, what I want to bring out is the same point in the beginning when the brother said that's not worthy to be a king. He doesn't look like it. He doesn't sound like it. The first thing I want to let you guys know is that faith will bring jealousy. Faith will, faith will bring anger because people don't understand radical faith. People that have been in the army for so long and they see someone coming up saying we can do this, they will then react with pride and anger and jealousy just like his brother and they will begin to make accusations against you just like his brother oh i know why you're here yeah i'm here to feed you faith i'm here to remind you of who your god is i'm here to remind you of everything he's already done and everything that his word tells us that he will do you see we got people's view and we got god's view we got people's view and our view of God. You see, because David, he's seen God's greatness and his power and his faithfulness. And when we begin to look at God in that manner, our enemies become small. But if we begin to look at our enemy the way that everyone else does, we'll become defeated. If we look at our appearance, and not the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us. If we look at the situation rather than the Christ that we sang about that's high exalted above all earth on his throne. You see, what do you, how do you view things? And what are you letting speak into your life? Because they said, David, you can't go out there, you'll die. This man's been a soldier his whole life. You're just a boy. Are you going to let people speak into your life or are you going to let God speak into your life? Oh, that's good. That's good. That's good. You see, because in verse 43, he cursed him by his gods. That gives us insight into Ephesians 6 that this isn't just a physical fight, that it is a spiritual fight. Back then when they would go to war, it was a war against gods. Whoever won claimed that their god was bigger. There is no God bigger than our God. There is no God or spirit or demon or devil that is big enough to destroy your family or to destroy your ministry or to destroy anything if you take on the perspective of the Word of God. Take on the perspective of God. How do I take on the perspective of God, preacher? Well, the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit reveals the mind of God to us. We have a choice to either listen to the enemy or listen to God that saved our souls. Again, it's people's view versus God's view. And it's people's view against our view of God. We can sit here and say, I believe what it says, but if we don't have a big view of God, then we get into situations where we're sad and depressed and full of anxiety and worry. Because we think, oh, God can save my soul for salvation, but he can't pay the light bill next week. 
He is a faithful God. David said, I've seen him time and time again. He destroyed the bear. He killed the lion. How many of you would like to go fight a lion with your hands? The reality is most of us see a lion, we're going the other way. But with God, He'd give us the power to overcome. And I just, faith brings anger. Especially when we begin to, as Sister said, as the enemy attempts to divide us and says, I'm taking your food stamps unless you take this mark. And you say, my God will provide, take it. People in the church will get angry with you. And say that you're not being a good parent. Don't you care about your children? People in the church will crucify you. That's what the spirit of religion did. I want you to understand we're going to Matthew 16, 16 through 17. Because we need to have an understanding of something here. About seeing things the way that God sees them. And he said to him... Who do you say that I am? You remember this story? He said, who do you say that I am? Oh, well, they said you're this and you're that and you're the other. He said, but Peter, who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered him in verse 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered to him and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is where being born again comes into play because we can't hear the voice of God other than calling us to repentance to tell us hey I love you and I want something better for you I've made a way for you to be forgiven the moment that we are filled with the Holy Spirit the Word of God begins to open up and we can begin to see the perception of Christ as he truly is people will no longer be able to make us to and fro and tossed in the winds and the waves of who Christ is. Even when they say your deliverance didn't happen, you're crazy. What do you mean? I heard the growlings, I heard the yellings, I heard the screams, I heard the cusses. I seen a manifestation and I acted like I never would have acted in my life. People will call you crazy. And people will call the deliverer that the Lord used The devil. That's what they did to Jesus. Jesus said if they did it to me, they'll do it to you. There's no ifs, no ands, no buts. There's no way around it. You see, but we need to develop the perception of God, not only on Christ, but our situation. God's seen your situation before you even came to the situation. God's seen your solution to the problem before you even knew there was a problem. He said, look at the flowers of the field. They are more beautifully arraigned than Solomon in his temple. He said, look at the birds. Every day we wake up and we hear them and we see them. We're going through another season. What I mean by that is we're coming into winter. We just left fall. Things started dying. It's about to freeze over if it has not already. And we're about to experience spring. That's a sign of God's faithfulness. The sun rose up and woke us all up. That's a sign of His faithfulness. The ground that we stand on is a sign of the sturdy rock of Christ that we stand on. The breeze is a reminder that His Spirit is breathed out upon all flesh. These are things that we need to perceive ourselves. Whatever your situation is, go outside and He breathed His Spirit into us. Allow that to be a reminder that the Holy Spirit is with you wherever you go. And that no man can take that from you. What Jesus Christ did, no man can take that from Him. Not only our situation, not only our enemies. But let me ask you this, do you have God's perception upon yourself? Because how we view ourselves, what if, what if Jesus... Listen to what other people said about him rather than what God was saying about him. What if he listened to other people and did what they accused him of rather than just following the Father's voice and doing what he has called him to do? You remember in John 1, 45 through 49, Jesus, they said, this is the one Moses talked about. 
He is Jesus, the son of, from Nazareth. And what did they say? Can anything come good from Nazareth? What if he would have took that and got depressed and said, God, I guess I'm not good enough. I guess I can't do what you call me to do. What if he would have listened to people? If God spoke it over you, trust his plan will come to pass. God doesn't give visions without provisions. It's okay to trust God. He is faithful. What if we, what if Jesus listened to them and said, you're a drunk. Well, I might as well just go drink. What if they said, Jesus, you're a sinner. You hang out with sinners. And he actually sinned. None of us would have salvation. None of us would have an opportunity to come to know the Father of all creation. None of us would come to know the Word that became flesh on our behalf. None of us would know the voice of the Holy Spirit that says, I love you. And I'm drawing you to a work that I ordained for you before the foundation of the world. What if Jesus listened to people rather than the voice of God? What if Jesus began to do the things that people accused him of doing? Because I've been there. Oh, you want to you wanna accuse me of being a thief? Okay, I'm going to show you a thief. In the world, I've done that. Oh, you want to you wanna say I have an anger problem? I'm going to show you angry. Have you ever said that, done that? Come on, we've all been there. In one way or another. Somebody accused you of something and you didn't really agree with it, so you showed them what that was. Well, brother read Ephesians chapter 2. We are no longer under the power and the dominion of darkness, but have been transferred to the kingdom of the beloved Son called to lay aside all of those things and truly follow Jesus. It doesn't matter. They told Jesus, oh, nothing good can come from over there. But Jesus did what the Father told him to do and said what he was told him to say. And then what happened? Christ was received glory. And people around him got to witness who he truly was. And so when we take that to ourselves and do what God has called us to do, regardless of who agrees or disagrees or likes it or doesn't like it, Christ, at the end of the day, will get the glory. He says in one of his epistles, Paul said, even if they accuse you of these things, live in such a way that they would honor your Father who's in heaven. That they can make accusations, 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 but it will not come to pass. Like me, so when I got out of prison, I got really big into weightlifting, and I got up to like 185 pounds. COVID happened, lost my gym membership, and I lost like 56 pounds. Got down to like 130 something pounds. People were like, this dude's back on dope. This dude's selling dope. No, just not going to the gym. But people made that accusation. What if I would have just said, people, think I'm back on drugs, I might as well go back on drugs. We wouldn't be here today having this conversation. Don't listen to people, listen to God. How do you know what He's saying? Get into your Word. His Word is unchangeable, it's inerrant, it's infallible. It's not going to change. They said nothing good can come from Nazareth. Maybe somebody said nothing good could come from your family, they're all drunks. They're all this, they're all that. Your mama did this, your daddy did this, your grandma did this, your grandma did this, and they did this. You're just going to be the same. Brother, you stand up and say, today it stops. God has given us that choice through Christ to say, I'm going to carry this on, or I'm going to carry on with Jesus. I'm not going to do what they did to me. I'm not going to treat them how they treated me. We don't have to follow them. Matthew 16, 21 through 24. Very familiar story as well. He says, From that time Jesus Christ began to show His disciples that He must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders, the chief priests and scribes, and be killed and be raised on the third day. Peter took Him aside and began to rebuke Him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. 
This shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Not everyone in your life is functioning from the Holy Spirit, okay? That's what he's telling us here. Even if they have the position. He told them, I'm going to the church leaders to be crucified. I'm going to the elders and the scribes and the Pharisees and they're going to hurt me and kill me. And Peter said, by never means, God. He had a mission from the Lord. Each one of you has a job and a purpose from the Lord. And don't let someone functioning in another spirit other than the Holy Spirit be a stumbling block to you. Follow Christ, even if people don't understand, even if they don't agree. Even if you don't agree. That's a big one. He said, deny yourself. Pick up your cross. Just know that God has called you and that there is a reward for those that run their race with diligence. Just know that Christ is in our Father's home preparing a room for us. If we shall run and not give up. Even if people don't understand. Even if they don't agree. What are you letting speak into your life? And does it align with the word of God? Who are you? If I were to ask you who are you? What would you say? Her child of God. Any other answers? You can answer freely. If you are who are you? You know, because some of us take on what other people say about us. I'm not good enough. I'm never going to amount to nothing. I'm worthless. I remember being five years old getting kicked out of my living room because my adopted mom said, Why are you in here? You're wasting my oxygen. You need to go upstairs. And that stuck with me for so long until I heard the voice of the Father say, I gave you that breath. It is not a waste. Who are you? God says you're fearfully, wonderfully made. Who are you? God says he who began a good work and you shall see it until the end. Just because man condemned you for a mistake, God did not. He said, I'm faithful and just. I'm full of mercy and forgiveness. If you would just come and reason with me. And I'll change you even though you're red like crimson. I'll make you white like snow. Those are God's voice. That's God's word. Who are we to contend with God? Remember he told that to Job. Who are you? Where were you when I created the foundations of the world? Well, where were you when he wrote those words over your life? Those were God's words. And he is impo it's impossible for him to lie. He spoke these things over you. He said, I'm willing and able to do infinitely more than you ask or imagine according to the work and the power that's in you. Don't limit the Holy Spirit of what He can do in your life. Don't limit the Holy Spirit of what He wants to do in your life. And quit making these cliches that just make us sound humble, but in reality it's dishonoring and dispowering to the Holy Spirit. Like I was talking to my wife one day and she yelled at me and she said, I can't change overnight. I said, why are you limiting what God can do in one night? Does he change everyone overnight? Reality is no. It's a process. But then again, I hear testimonies where people are changed overnight. And so why are you limiting God for what he wants to do in your life? Because it sounds good. Oh, I'm just human. What do you mean? You're limiting the power of the Holy Spirit that says, I've given you power over your thoughts. I've given you power over the enemy. I've given you power over sin. Oh, but I'm just human. Sure, you're just human. That's why we make mistakes. We're not just human to make excuses to sin. We're not just human to make excuses to take man's opinion over God's. We're not just human to take man's word over God's word. 
Sure, we are all dead in our trespasses, but when we're born again, we're born again supernatural. Quit limiting the Holy Spirit in your life. Quit limiting the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. Quit limiting just because you want to be liked. The question is, do you want to be liked by man or received by God? Because they're on two opposite sides of the spectrum. What if David showed up to the battle and said, you know what, you are right. I'm not made for war. I'm going back to my sheep. The rest of the story wouldn't have played out the way it played out. The Israelites would have became slaves. David would have probably never became king. We would have never had a Messiah because he was meant to come from the line of David. It was prophesied and fulfilled that he would come from the line of David. So whatever God has called you to do, just know that there is a purpose and there is a reason. Even if people do not agree, even if they want to persecute you and talk about you because of it. Paul said, do I want to be liked by man or liked by Christ? If I wanted to be a, a pleaser of man, he said, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Amen? What do you want? Who do you want to please? The Lord. The Lord. Amen. Why? Because He has already proven His love for you. Amen. How many of you have ever had somebody tell you, Oh, I love you, and then turn around and do something you just don't like? Yep. How many of you have ever had somebody say, Oh, I won't ever do that again, turn around and do it again? Mm -hmm. And then the next time somebody says, Oh, I love you. And you put up these, all these walls and said, well, you're going to have to prove it to me. You're going to have to prove your love to me. But you know what? I got so many walls and barriers that I'm not even going to let you prove it to me. The Bible says God's already taken his initiative to prove to you his love by sending his son. It's not a matter of, I'm not entirely sure about this one. He says, before you even knew me, I started proving my love to you. Before you even knew me, I began to show you my faithfulness and my love and my grace and my mercy. Just read my word. Crucify your flesh that says, I can't do this. How many of you know that a half truth is still a whole lot? The half truth is, I can't do this. You're absolutely right, but that's the whole lot. I can't do, you're absolutely right. But the full truth is you can't, but God can. Amen. That's right. Let the half truth become enough just to humble you to receive the truth. Who is Christ? Who is the Word? Who is the Holy Spirit? Don't get stuck on the half truth because it becomes a whole lie. Oh, you're not good. You won't do this. You can't amount. You can't do this. I try to perfect drug dealing. Nine years old, I picked up crack cocaine and started selling dope. I tried to perfect it by the time I was 18. I had this entire mindset that if I walked down the street in a three-piece suit as a drug dealer, nobody would pull me over. I don't have dark skin like my family. They're going to think I'm some lawyer somewhere. Some do some. I tried to perfect it any which way that I could. I didn't pick up my first dope case until I was 18. And that was because I got set up because somebody finally just, whatever. I try to perfect this. The world will try and perfect you into damnation. The world will try to perfect you into not receiving the full power of the Holy Spirit in your life because they don't want to surrender to God. And now they're angry with you because you do. When the truth begins real to you and the Holy Spirit begins to allow the Word of God that is alive become active and sharper than any two-edged sword and it begins to, not because of a YouTube preacher, not because of Google, not because of commentary, but because you sit down in the presence of the Lord and say, Father, show me your Word. Give me a spirit of revelation with the Holy Spirit and give me knowledge and wisdom and He begins to bring it to life. You see, what are you letting speak into your life? Who are you letting speak into your life? 
David's brothers saw a shepherd. God saw a king after his own heart. Daniel, I mean, Goliath saw just a boy. And yet, David saw God. May we be looking to God. I want to read one more section of Scripture so that we can bring this to a close and truly have an understanding of what are we speaking into our lives and the detrimental impact that it can have if we are listening to people over God because we see this in Numbers 13 starting in 25. And when they returned from spying out the land at the end of the 40 days, remember God promised a land overflowing with milk and honey to Abram. He said, I'm going to give you this land as a promise, my son. And I'm going to multiply your descendants. And you're going to be a great nation. Right? And he, when they got there, they, they orchestrated spies to go out and spy across the land. And when they returned, they proceeded to come to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the sons of Israel, the wilderness of Paran and Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. This they told them and said, We went into the land where you sent us, and it certainly does flow with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people in the land are strong, and the cities are fortified and very large. And moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. Amalek is living in the land of the Negev and the Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites are living in the hill country. The Canaanites are living by the sea and by the side of the Jordan. Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, we should by all means go up and take possession of it, for we shall surely overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against these people. They're too strong for us. So they gave out to the sons of Israel a bad report of the land, which they would spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone and spying is out is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. They're also... We saw the Nephilim, the sons of Anak, are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would that we had died in the wilderness? And why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? And so they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of the assembly of the congregation. And Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes. They spoke to the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we passed... Throw to spy it out an exceedingly good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, He'll bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord and do not fear the people of the land, for they shall be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. So again, we see someone reacting in faith. The Lord has spoken, and I'm taking action. And people said, we need to kill you. We need to take you out. You're being crazy. Again, radical faith and obedience, is, it creates frustration and tension with those Christians that are comfortable. I want to let you know that a comfortable Christian in this next season is going to become a casualty. Because we have this no mind left, no man left behind thing because we love our brothers, but the reality is not everybody's truly serving our Lord. Not everybody's willing to deny themselves and pick up their cross and follow Christ. They're trying to follow a man behind a pulpit. If I ever tell you, come follow me, you need to correct me. A good leader says, here's Christ. Come and meet Christ. And the moment you get here, let me get behind you to keep you here with Jesus. Amen. Not come follow me and come follow my program. Oh, that's right. Amen. 
Faith brings jealousy. Will you walk by faith or you walk by sight? Faith is taking God at His word. Remember, Abram was considered righteous because he believed God, not because he believed in God. It's because he took Him at His word and said, I don't understand. I don't see the solution. But you said it, so it's going to be done. It's going to be no other way because my God has spoken. It's going to have no other outcome because my God has spoken. There should be no other way because I have already prayed to my God that's spoken. When we come in alignment with God and His will, He said, anything you ask shall come to pass if it's according to my will. It shall be no other way. You see, war creates, or action creates war. It creates war within the church. Because some of us want to just sit here and not do anything and say hallelujah and go home. The rest of us truly have a spirit of the Lord that says, I need to honor my brothers and my sisters and I need to unify and edify the body. I need to glorify my Lord Jesus and I need to seek out and save those that are lost. Acts says, when you receive the power of the Holy Spirit, it will give you power to be a witness. Not a power to be lazy. We can't be selfish with our salvation. You see, we are promised victory. Christ has overcome the grave. He's already seated at the right hand of our Father. He's already poured out His Spirit. And it's already written that He's coming back. You see, but there's a war going on in the church between religion and following Christ. Religion and following Christ. Religion has a way of building walls up around people and suppressing the truth. Following Christ says, I'm a peacemaker. The Bible doesn't say we're called to be peacekeepers. We're peacemakers. And you know what? In order to make peace, sometimes there has to be war. Sometimes there has to be action. Sometimes there has to be hurt feelings and a loving rebuke. One of the most loving things we could do is rebuke a brother that is in error according to the Word of God and love than just letting him fall by the wayside. But just know, when we begin to follow Christ to the fullest of what that means, the other parts of the gospel will become true. And Paul said, I was your friend when I was in person with you. Now that I've begun to speak truth to you, have I become your enemy? To some, yes. Because some have gotten comfortable with their demons. Some of people actually feed their demons and then come to church and then begin to be frustrated and manifest. But because the church is so unequipped and uneducated we begin to bicker at each other instead of actually fighting the true fight of faith there is a there is a war in the church of religion and following Christ religion says there's no power in fasting we don't need to do that religion says we don't need to do that there's no power in this there's no power in that there's no power in this we just say, Jesus, 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 we get to make it. Remember, Jesus, any that say, Lord, Lord, did I not do this? Did I not do that? Did I not do this? He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you, worker of lawlessness. You see, there's people in the church that are functioning under gifts. Healing. Didn't we heal in your name? Sure. God reigns on the just and the unjust. He healed ten lepers and only two of them came back. Didn't we prophesy in your name? Sure. You said some words. But you only acted like that in front of the body of Christ. Right. You didn't act like that towards your spouse. You didn't act like that to the homeless man down the street. And if you went out on an outing, it was just so you could come back to the church and say, look what I did. We got people in the church that want to get involved just so that they can mark off their good deeds on a list. 
instead of actually just surrendering to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you have for me? What do you want me to do for your glory, your honor? Who are you trying to reach out to? Who are you trying to expand your kingdom to? For the kingdom of God is already here. You see, true Christianity requires action. Faith is not a stagnant word. It's an action word. You cannot just sit here and say, I believe. Even the demons tremble and believe. But there's no hope of salvation for them. As part of the, I, was, I was orchestrating by the privilege of the Lord the other day. I was, I was orchestrating a deliverance. And the demon just kept saying, I chose wrong. I chose wrong. I chose wrong. I chose wrong. You did choose wrong. You could be sitting with the two-thirds instead of the one-thirds on the way to hell. You could be sitting with the two-thirds ministering to the church of God instead of on the way to the eternal lake of fire. You did choose wrong. I am a witness that God, the moment that I've actually come to hear His voice, He's never lied to me. Everything He's ever told me has come to pass. He is faithful. He is loving. He's merciful. He's graceful. I can't imagine the angels when it was only them and God. But because of pride, they were willing to throw it all away. And now they scream out, I chose wrong. What are you going to choose today? Don't choose wrong. Don't choose man's opinion over God's word. Don't choose the society's view of your situation. Oh, you just need to go back into the world, brother. It's okay, just pick that bottle up again. It's okay, just roll one more blunt. Come on. How about you just skip a meal and get into the presence of God? How about you just tell the Lord, you know what, I'm not watching TV for a week because I need to just be in your presence and hear your voice instead of the voice of what this TV is yelling at me. If we want our families to change for the glory of God, then we need to hang out with the Lord as a family. We can't have mama doing Bible study, dad at work all day, and then come home and expect things to be okay. They need to have individual studies, absolutely, but we also need to come together as a family. Because our family is the Lord's, and He's part of our family. And He wants to sit down with us and worship the Father. He wants to be worshipped in our presence. It requires action. Faith requires action. James said, faith without works is dead. It doesn't matter if you believe and say this and say that if you're not putting action to the Word. And it's the same thing when it comes to deliverance. We have churches that say, oh, we believe in the devil. There wouldn't be a Jesus without the devil. You're absolutely right. Christ came to establish His kingdom. And that's by removing darkness. By removing those spirits out of the way and allowing the light to flow through people. We can sit here, and this is why we have to be careful, because people in the right position will say the wrong thing and will listen to them. And this is why we need to know Christ's voice, because Christ will never lead us astray. Christ will never send anybody to tell you something that's in contradiction to the written word. It just, it will never happen. We have so many prophets and so many leaders saying, well, this is what I think. Mm -hmm. Why can't we just sit down with the Word and see what God says? Can we just pray until God gives us an understanding of what it's being done and said and X, Y, Z? We don't have to listen to somebody just because they have history. People in history can have error. There is no error in Jesus. You see, the warriors, they had history. And they were not willing to go fight the fight. But David knew who his God was. And he was willing to go. And we know the rest of the story. That giant fell. And he didn't get back up. He didn't get knocked out. He died. 
And the time is coming when our enemy will be no more. But the question is, do you want to be no more with Him? Or do you want to reign forever with Christ? Because who we let speak into our lives now, and how we view our situations, and how we view our God, will all play out into that. Because trust me, that's how we end up relapsing. Not just on drugs, but relapsing into the world. Picking our anger back up. Picking up our bitterness. Picking up our unforgiveness. Picking up our doubts. Picking up our resentments. Picking up our worries. Rather than just keeping our eyes on God. And what He says in His Word. Don't let them speak to you. Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. And the reality is, we need to say the same thing to the people that are being stumbling blocks in our life. Because that's what he said. He said, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me and you're concerned about the things of man and not the things of God. You tell somebody, I don't think you're reacting in the Holy Spirit, brother. They might condemn you. Again, we serve Jesus. Jesus promises to empower us. He promises to give us victory. But we need to get a proper perspective of God and what He says.